Thank you, Chairpersons. And in the beginning, I would thank Do you, ma'am, if you can join, please. Uh, Dr. Bansi Sabu, uh, Dr. Bharat Sabu, and Dr. Jain, and all the stalwarts of the organizing committee. Today, I have been given a topic to speak about the oral hypoglycemic agents in the man, in hospital patient. So, let us begin with that. And um, all of you know that this topic is a uh, deceptive one that uh, when we talk about insulin in the in patients and all hyperglycemia probably would be addressed by the insulin therapy in indoor patients. But uh, the use of oral agents in the hospital se setting are really not recommended in hospitals because there are few data available regarding their safety and efficacy. They are not predictable in action in indoor patients. Uh, there are some limitations because of their side effects of the uh, side effects profile of the oral drugs, and that is why. Uh, however, there could be some small indications of oral therapy in hospitalized patient for certain subset of the patients where we can use this therapy. Now, when we talk about the oral hypoglycemic agents in hospital settings, as I mentioned earlier. The safety and efficacy of OHA in hospital setting is an area of research. A few recent RCTs, like we have seen during COVID, the use of sexagliptin in COVID patients, or they have said, or the use of DPP with a uh, basal insulin therapy in some patients where we can use in the in hospitalized patient for the glycemic control. Again, FDA bulletin states that Providers should consider discontinuing sexagliptin and allogliptin in people who develop heart failure. GLP-1 receptor agonist may be problematic in patient setting because they are still, there were some uh, data regarding GLP-1 infusion in hospitalized patients for control of hyperglycemia. But then dose titration, their side effects and uh, other things which were not comfortable for the indoor management of hyperglycemia. And then now a lot of um, noise is about SGLT2 inhibitors and FDA has said that it should be avoided in severe illness and probably during perioperative period of uh, 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 patients having hyperglycemia, we should take off as we are taking off metformin from the prescription, we should really uh, take away the SGLT2 inhibitors before the surgical procedures. So uh, this is what I'm going to speak about, uh, the uh, hyperglycemia problem and then a historical overview followed by introduction of non-insulin therapy. Now you know that um, inpatient hyperglycemia is a common scenario in hospital across the world. 20 to 40 percent of the hospitalized patients have inpatient hyperglycemia in USA almost 80 to 31 percent in UK and uh, 18 percent of the patients in Spain were hospitalized having uh, hyperglycemia in the during their hospitalization. So as Dr. Um, Agrawal mentioned that 20 percent of the patient without a diagnosis of diabetes presenting to emergency department may have newly recognized hyperglycemia or first time detected hyperglycemia. So that is the 20% of the patients will be found out to have diabetes for the first time or hyperglycemia for the first time in patient hyperglycemia. They are associated with increased morbidity, increased mortality, and they are associated with increased healthcare utilization. Now, if you look at the current pattern, Current anti-diabetic treatment patterns in hospitalized patients in diabetes in UK, USA, and Spain, then the prevalence is around 10% in USA, 7.5% in UK, and 13.8% of Spain. Prevalence of inpatient hyperglycemia is 20 to 40% in non-critically ill patients and up to 40% in critically ill patients and up to 60 to 80% in post-cardiac bypass surgery. In UK, it was ultimately 18.1 to 31% and in Spain around 18.4% in non-critical ill patient. 
Use of non-insulin agents in hospitalization, the data are very scarce in USA, while almost 40% of the population use uh, non-insulin agents in UK. And in Spain also, there are some uses of the drugs like metformin, sulfonylureaglinide, SGLT, etc. in, in hospitalized patients. Use of insulin sliding scale alone was up to 31 to 40 percent in USA and almost 6.6 percent in type 1 diabetes and 35 percent in patients who were treated with insulin in type 2 diabetes and 8 percent not on insulin infusion. And in Spain, it was around 20 percent. So there is a lot of um, variability is seen in this subset of the people and in different areas of the uh, world. The challenges in past regarding the management, many patients before two decades, many doctors did not really understood the magnitude and severity of hyperglycemia and management was casual, relied upon continuing home medicines, including metformin, sulfonylurea, and often they were given sliding scale of insulin. And there was a very heavy reliance of, uh, on sliding scale of insulin with the reactive approach to the blood sugar and just treat them when they are high without thinking about the consequences. So we have a lot of improvement from the past and there is a 42% relative reduction in mortality and intensively treated patients with surgical IC was observed. And here, and then all of you must be aware that the current recommendation is that targeted blood sugar in hospital should be around 140 to 180 milligram per deciliter. And from this point on, a more relaxed glycemic target has been recommended in most of the ICU patients. The patients where you put them on insulin, you have to have good monitoring. Prevention of hypoglycemia is also important and it utilizes lot of resources uh, in the uh, regime and the usual basal bolus regime is complex in patients and that is why uh, there was an introduction to non-insulin therapies in this subset of the patients. Now the first use which is uh, probably use of DPV-4 inhibitors, they are well tolerated they are associated with lower risk of hypoglycemia. They are non-inferior glycemic outcome compared to basal bolus regime in patients with mild hyperglycemia. So study suggested that patients with mild to moderate inpatient hyperglycemia, frail, elderly patient and those with renal failure or high risk of hypoglycemia may safely manage with this simplified approach of DPV-4 inhibitors with basal insulin. So this is a caveat. You cannot use this kind of therapy in all patients, but if you have mild hyperglycemia and if you are having certain subset of patients who are aged and hypo, uh, frequent frequency of hypoglycemia, you can use this approach. Hospitalized patients with admission glucose below 100 180 to 200 milligram per deciliter. The use of basal insulin plus correctional insulin and or DPV-4 inhibitors may be considered. And patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery can be the candidates for this kind of therapy with DPV-4 plus correction of rapid insulin or with the basal insulin therapy. GLP, as I mentioned, and it is not uh, possible to use the GLP in in patient hospitalization except for those patients who are not really undergoing major surgery or not going to be kept or kneel by mouth for a prolonged period, very rarely we can use GLP-1 agents in this situation. The use of SGLT2 inhibitors is very really um, hot topic today because many of the patients with the cardiorenal benefit would be on SGLT2 inhibitors in indoor patients. And SGLT2 inhibitors are relatively safe with low level of hypoglycemia. Acidosis as measured by plasma bicarbonate or ketonemia. But adding this therapy during discharge process may improve the clinical inertia and allow more patients to benefit from this situation. 
But during hospitalization, there are um, recommendations that individuals undergoing minor surgery may continue with SGLT2 inhibitors. But SGLT2 inhibitor therapy should be withheld at least 72 hours prior to all major surgeries and plasma glucose level closely monitored perioperatively. And there should be vigilant post-operative uh, monitoring for diabetic ketoacidosis even with normal plasma glucose levels, especially if signs or symptoms of DKA develop. SGLT2 inhib inhibitor therapy should only be restarted after the nutritional and fluid balance are stabilized without hypovolemia, ketosis or cata catabolism approximately 3 to 5 days for most people and up to 4 to 6 weeks for those who have undergone bariatric surgery. The SGLT2 inhibitor therapy should only be treated, restarted in individuals if their antihypertensive diuretic therapy is stable and there is no ongoing hemodynamic or renal function instability. So metformin, obviously nobody recommends metformin. Metformin is used in 20 to 50 percent of the patients admitted in the hospitals in developing countries. And we also often see the patients who were already on metformin and once you have taken off metformin in intraoperative or the perioperative period, the diabetes control becomes difficult, especially in obese patients. So there is a time which comes where you are giving full dose of insulin, still diabetes is not under control, patient is hemodynamically stable, needs a, uh, better control, then you can think of giving metformin in certain situations. But it should not be used in patients with lactic acidosis, renal failure, sepsis, hemodynamic instability, hypoxia, liver failure, alcoholism. We should not use metformin in indoor patients. Sulfonylurea, again, we have seen the non-predictability of the response. It needs a, a basic uh, uh, insulin axis. And then there is a very high incidence of hypoglycemia, which ranges from 20 to 30 percent in this situation. And that is why sulfonylurea is not greatly recommended in indoor patients. Again, high risk of hypoglycemia, which I mentioned. And the hypoglycemia, which is caused by sulfonylurea, may persist for very long time and that we should keep it in mind. Use of thiazolendine dions, we know that they are associated with volume retention. Uh, they are safe in otherwise, but uh, there are issues related to unpredictability of the sugar control and um, uh, the thiazolendine use in hospital is less common and prevalence is less than 10%. They have, they take time to achieve glycemic outcome, several weeks to months predisposition to fluid retention and heart failure decompensation with anemia, fractures and all other things are responsible which will tell us not to use the, this thing. So here there is a brief summary of all the therapies which you can see from insulin, metformin, secretagog and there are advantages of these therapies and there are disadvantages of this therapy which can be seen here followed by thiazolendine dance, SGLT, alpha glucosidase inhibitor, GLP-1 and DPP-4 inhibitors. So lastly, the future of inpatient diabetes management would depend upon correction of insulin alone or basal insulin plus uh, correction insulin, basal bolus therapy, metformin, what we should consider and what we should avoid which is uh, depicted in this table and from this we can keep uh, everything in mind regarding the in-hospitalized patients. Uh, the future of in-hospitalized patients among frail patients with or those with target glycemic outcomes, less aggressive regime, reduce the risk of iatrogenic hypoglycemia and use of correction of insulin alone usually works in insulin new patients who are recently diagnosed and their blood sugar levels are less than 180 milligram. If glycemic targets are not achieved in 24 to 48 hours, adding insulin, a basal insulin or a starting dose of 0.1 to 0.25 per kilogram body weight or sometimes you may need to add 
bolus insulin therapy before meals as per the requirement in indoor patients and the future would be oral anti drugs plus correction of uh, correctional uh, subcutaneous uh, sliding scale insulin therapy where there is a low glycemia new diagnosis no prior treatment we can think of this and then moving further when you need to have any intermediate complexity regimen you can go basal basal insulin plus minus oral anti diabetic drugs and then if you have uncontrolled diabetes patient has got high blood sugars a1c is high uh, then you can think of giving basal bolus plus correctional therapy in this patients this is i would skip because it is not the part of this thing in summary i would say that in patient hyperglycemia is common scenario in hospital across the world affecting the patients with prior diagnosis of diabetes or those with stress hyperglycemia 20 years ago there were many challenges in management of in patient hyperglycemia such as clinician did not pay attention management relied on continuing home medicines including metformin sulfonylurea and sliding scale of therapy however reliance on reactive approach of using uh subcutaneous uh, i mean sliding scale therapy has reduced drastically with the current understanding of diabetes since 2000 the american diabetes association and american association of clinical endocrinology guidelines have advised better management of diabetes in hospital because of several drawbacks of such basal bolus regime is complex complex labor there is an unmet need for non insulin therapies to be introduced newer therapies like dpp4 glp1 sglt2 metformin sulfonylurea are being recommended occasionally and ada 2022 made several recommendations regarding the management of inpatient hyperglycemia using non insulin therapy but the uh, constraint of time i would end here and thank you very much for patient listening thank you